the topic of my uh, presentation is going to be the strain and um, strain imaging. And uh, while we are waiting for my slides, uh, probably the majority in this room will ask herself uh, why we do need uh, strain imaging at all. And uh, another question probably is going to be how we can do it. And the third one, probably the most tough one, is going to be uh, how we can interpret uh, the findings that we uh, get finally. So. Um, Searching for those answers uh, for me started 12 years ago uh, in the Leuven uh, with the Leuven's group of fellows uh, were probably, we were uh, part of e-cardiology that we are not aware of it. Uh, there you can find uh, e-electrical uh, and bioengineers together with the cardiologists uh, solving together the same problem from a different point of view. So uh, I would like to thank you. Uh, organizing committee to invite me here and uh, I will try to answer some of these uh, questions. So um, when we are performing echocardiography, uh, the most time we are using our eyes, so we are doing some uh, visually or uh, qualitative assessment of the uh, data and um, the mostly uh, quantitative assessment that uh, is a standard protocol in echocardiography is related on the uh, global uh, measurements. That, so the global function, we already have um, enough uh, quantitative data. I won't discuss are they are good enough or not, but the problem is that we are very uh, limited in uh, quantitating the regional function of the segments uh, in myocardium and uh, nowadays we really do need uh, quantitation of the regional function. So the uh, first attempt to uh, solve this uh, problem, to get some uh, quantitative data on a regional function, starts uh, almost 30 years ago, where the uh, Doppler data, apart from the, uh, assessing the uh, blood velocities, were try to assess uh, the velocities that uh, actually were rejected by machine or filtered by machine. So uh, we were now switched from the blood to the tissue, so to the lower velocities but with the higher amplitude. Uh, so we are able actually to extract the data from the velocities of the, uh, each part of the uh, myocardium. So uh, by the velocities performed with the Doppler data, we are able to extract them with the pulse wave Doppler tissue data and with the color coded uh, data. So the pulse wave data will give us a spectral uh, curves like you see here, where we define the systolic motion and diastolic motion. Here you can see that we have some events in isovolumic relaxation time and isovolumic contraction time that are, are now really part of the most scientific interest. By the color-coded Doppler uh, tissue data, we are actually give, uh, extract the curves that are a little bit low because they are average of uh, the time. But velocities are uh, not giving us the answer about really a regional contractile function. As you can see here, the uh, apical part of the heart is actually moving. So we will get velocities. But do we really get the function? So do we have information on the function of this uh, part? Of course not, this is only passive movement. So we have to be aware that velocities do have limitations. So they are combined of the global heart movement and a regional function. So we have to go on further to extract actually more precise parameter on the function and this is the formation. So there are two different uh, information that we can get. So we can get information on the whole deformation in, in a percentage like you see here, the both segments do have the same 
amount of deformation. But another information we can get as well is uh, the rate of this deformation. So how fast the segment is deforming is uh, another very precise information that we can get as well. So this is the strain rate. When we are telling about the term of strain rate, actually we are telling you about how fast the segment is deforming. And the strain is the global amount of deformation that is actually seen. From the velocities, it is easy to calculate by the spatial gradient the strain rate and with the temporal integration we will get the amount of the strain, so amount of deformation. So if we go back to the uh, uh, echo insertion, so we are easily getting information on uh, actually deformation of the particular segment uh, here and we can extract the uh, curves. Of course, now the question is, is this uh, method validated? It is. It is validated firstly in the jelly, in a phantom, then in experimental uh, work by sonomino, uh, sonomicrometry with the crystals, and you can see a nice correlation with that, and of course with the MRI in um, uh, tagging uh, method where the uh, correlation is really, uh, really close. The another method recently, uh, 10 years ago probably now, is a speckle tracking that will uh, give us as well information on deformation. It's completely different approach to the same uh, problem. Uh, so the uh, software is actually searching for the point, it's a speckle, and track it over the each frame. And of course the question is how is system able to recognize the same speckle to track it? So uh, what actually uh, is uh, system doing for us? So it's comparing the uh, each part, each speckle over the frame, and then look for the similarity. At the end, the system will choose which one uh, of the speckle is really representing at the, from the beginning. So it's going to be probably the, this one, and the process is of course repeating for the each speckle. And uh, this uh, method uh, has uh, uh, really a lot of advantages, but because of uh, two-dimensional background, uh, there are some very serious limitations as well, so we have to be aware of them, you will see later on. So the uh, speckle tracking method is really angle independent, and uh, we can get uh, all, all three components of the deformation. But uh, what we uh, really like and the people do appreciate more speckle tracking method is it's less uh, operator dependent and it's easier to use. There are different solutions, so uh, for the different vendors give us a different solution how to measure it. You can uh, use a velocity vector image, so the deformation is can be uh, represented as vectors, like you see here, or it, it can be represented as a color-coded different um, uh, rate of uh, deformation in um, uh, whole uh, segments. But, uh, and as well to this train uh, was validated by the uh, sonominocrity and um, MRI tagging, but you see those correlation is not so pure as uh, you see for the myocardial velocity and there are explanations for that. Uh, but of course the another question is uh, what we uh, and how we can uh, interpret the uh, values that we get. So what is ad information for our clinical work for that? For that we really do need to understand what are we measuring. And if you look at the segment, you should be aware that there are three direction, three major directions that each segment is deforming. It's a radial, longitudinal, and circumferential. And of course, it's not simple as that because uh, those uh, combination of each of them 
it's actually nine combination of the strain that the, this segment is doing during cardiac cycle. At the moment, we are able to measure only three of them, so uh, longitudinal and circumferential and a radial one. So if we look at the radial, so what the system is going to tell us, uh, it's going to give us uh, such a curve. It's a normal strain curve, so this is a normal amount of deformation for the uh, desired segment that we want uh, to um, estimate. And of course, uh, we would like to know what are those peaks telling us. And um, the, another approach is uh, what is the normal value of this peak strain. But of but uh, for the uh, answer it, what are the normal values? There are a different approach, so we have to be aware of which method we are using, what is the frame rate of the uh, method, what are uh, the population that we are actually uh, measuring, and etc. So, uh, is there any clinical value? Of course it is. You can see here, this is the normal uh, 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 sucks or uh, circumferential um, uh, view of the myocardium of the normal ventricle and here is the radial uh, deformation here with the uh, peak uh, strain of uh, over 60 percent and dilated uh, ventricle with a very low radial strain of the only 18 percent. If you look how the, the longitudinal deformation looks like, you see it's in an um, opposite way and the strain rate is um, about 1 uh, uh, meter per, per second and with two peaks in diastole as well you will see that there is uh, some uh, strain rate in the isovolumic uh, relaxation and isovolumic contraction and the uh, strain is uh, in the opposite direction so uh, and the values are a little bit lower for the longitudinal compared to the uh, radial one so we have a peak systolic strain we have early filling and late filling uh, strain for the uh, segment that we choose for the normal values so we have to be aware that there is a general cutoff value which will separate the normal from the abnormal do not exist. Uh, range of values, uh, uh, the term uh, normality exists, so uh, we have to know what are actually the range where we have to put the normals. But the most important thing is to know and to look at is the pattern of the curve. So uh, if you look at those uh, curves, you see that uh, this one is really far enough of the normal pattern uh, from the normal uh, pattern of the curves that we uh, see previously. So this is the car, scar and there is no deformation at all during systole, while this one is little flattened compared to the normal, so this is uh, represent ischemic uh, segment. And you see here that uh, the red, uh, the yellow, uh, green one represents the apex, the red one the mid-segment and the black one is the base. So this is the uh, septum and compared to, to the uh, uh, baseline, uh, uh, compared to the uh, infarction at the baseline, you see that the apical part is really not deforming uh, at all. And you can um, visualize this uh, data like uh, this one with the ball size or uh, in more three-dimensional uh, looks like where you see here that the ap apical is not deforming at all and this part is very less one. So uh, the question how to interpret uh, the different data from different modalities because they're giving us uh, completely uh, different normal values there you see uh, uh, that myocardial uh, velocity imaging compared to the 2D strain and vector velocities uh, is the 2D strain more uh, lower data than the others as well for the uh, complete strain and uh, in, in that we are asking ourselves so 
in all those mess of the data, how we can uh, use it clinically. The problem is in a frame rate, problem is in different segmentation, and of course, spatial average. So, um, for the uh, age of the patient, we uh, should know that the uh, during uh, early uh, childhood, the strain rate values really decline very fast, and uh, strain rate as well. The frame rate is most important one. So the frame rate really differentiate modalities which are we going to use and how we can interpret the data. So uh, myocardial velocity imaging give us a uh, data based on the frame rate more than 100 frames per second. So from the velocity we extract the strain rate, with the integration we extract the strain. With the speckle tracking data, we have only 55 frames per second and we go in opposite direction, from the strain to the strain rate. So first we have the data on the strain, then on the strain rate. And now, you see, those are the curves from the myocardial velocity data. So if we uh, combine, uh, look how the frame rate is going to uh, going to impact, give impact on our curves, you will see very soon. So if we have only three samples on this event, you'll see we're going to sample it here, here and here. We're going to miss the peak value of the velocity of the deformation of the strain rate. So our curve is going to look like this and so the value is going to be 1.7 compared to exact value of 2.1. And we, if we increase the samples, of course, we, our values is, peak value is going to be the higher because this very short living event, we're going to pick with the increased sample rate. So it is that the frame rate do matter for the imaging modalities that we are using for extra deformation. So if we want to have precise data on a very short living events, for extra deformation, we should use modality with a very high frame rate. If we want to like, if we want to uh, look after the global quantitative measure of the strain, then we can probably use a most uh, uh, lesser frame rate, like a speckle tracking, because it's uh, of course uh, less operator dependent. It's easier to use. And uh, you see here, uh, uh, we should know that if we are using modality with very low frame rate, we are not able to look after or to measure and, and uh, uh, seek for any, any events during probably isovolumic uh, relaxation or isovolumic contraction time, because we are, we are not measuring anything here with the low frame rate. And segmentation does matter as well. Uh, velocity vector imaging is giving us through segmentation of the ventricle, while myocardial velocity imaging is actually not giving us true EPIX uh, data, so this one has to be keep in mind. Uh, and uh, we are uh, very soon uh, at the end. Just so if you would like to, for example, look after the formation and to detect infarct related segments, then probably you should choose the uh, Doppler-based uh, strain modality because you see here in this uh, work how the data from the infarct segment are lower compared to the 2D strain. As well, the remote uh, and ejected segment are uh, much more differentiated compared to the 2D strain uh, data. At, at the end, so 1D and 2D strain imaging have shown to have a really added value. So with the strain and strain imaging, we can, uh, we can have a more clinical and uh, precise information on regional function if we are interested in. Uh, one magic value do not exist. So we should, in our diagnostic uh, process, keep this in mind and 
uh, look uh, what actually uh, disease we are looking after and uh, what uh, our question is in a term to uh, really find the best modality to give us the answer. So important is to interpret the pattern of the curve on the top of the uh, absolute uh, values. So this is going to be my uh, message and uh, I hope I answer at least one question of the beginning three one. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, are there questions? May, may I start off with one question? I'm, I'm a little bit more in interventional cardiology than with echocardiography, mm -hmm. so it could be very naive. Uh, the strain rate imaging, is that incorporated today into the ultrasound machine? Yes. Yes. And was there not a study uh, with phantoms that showed that if you use uh, one machine versus the other, that the results are different. Are yeah. very much different. Yes. Not small, <laughs> but very much. Yeah, that I so. was trying to explain. Uh, of course, y you need a, a particular software that will calculate here the strain rate and the strain from the velocities. So therefore, might be the differences. Another difference is the frame rate of your uh, origin image that you are acquiring. And uh, uh, there is, uh, I tried to show the frame rate really does matter. So if your frame rate is uh, lower, so your data and your uh, strain rate peak values are going to be lower. So that's, that's the basic principle we should always uh, uh, think of. So if you're working in an outpatient echocardiographic clinic and you have multiple vendors, machines, you should take care that the patient is coming back for the follow-up study is being examined with the exact same equipment and exact same I, I won't say uh, it's not such a necessary, but uh, the most important is the parameters of your imaging has to be the same. So the angle of installation, the particular depth and... and um, so the point where you place uh, your uh, um, point of interest has to be uh, uh, at least on, on the same part. Right. Are there more questions? If not, then thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay.